The People's School is part of our series that we're doing related to five of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And we're really pleased to have Connie Clement join us today as our resource person. Before we move any further, however, I would certainly like to acknowledge that we are gathered here today in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded land of the Mi'kmaq people. We are very grateful for the opportunity to work, learn, play, and share these lands of, of our Indigenous brothers and sisters, and to hopefully work together in a true spirit of truth and reconciliation as we move forward. Having said that, I would certainly like to welcome all of you. Uh, my name is Pauline McIntosh, and I'm part of a, the community housing program team here at the Cody Institute. And several of my colleagues are on the call with me today as well. Because we've got uh, such a wonderful crew of folks with us, I think we will invite you to introduce yourself in chat uh, rather than going around the room. But I would certainly like to uh, say that Nancy O'Regan is here. Nancy, you want to give a shout out or a wave? Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Nancy. Nancy is going to be co-facilitating today's People's School with me. Kelly Schneer is in the room. Kelly is my colleague who's working uh, on our Sustainable Development Goals and Affordable Housing Project. We also have Catherine Irving. Hi, Catherine. Catherine is our fantastic um, person who's in charge of documentation for all of the work that we do. It's important for us to collect what we're hearing and to share that in a meaningful way uh, with back with you and also with others who couldn't be part of the People's School today. So thank you, Catherine. And we have Brian Lazuri. And Brian is providing technical support and is our manager of communications and always does a great job of making sure people know about the events that we're hosting as part of our work. Nancy, can I turn it over to you to introduce uh, Connie more officially before we get started? I would be happy to, Pauline, thank you. And welcome again, Paul, um, Connie. Connie's a volunteer director with the Anakinish Affordable Housing Society, and I hear her contributions there have been many. Um, in the past, she's directed the National Collaborative Center for the Determinants of Health at St. of X, a national public health knowledge center that existed from, and she did that work from 2011 until she retired in 2019. But prior to that, Connie worked for Toronto Public Health, Health Nexus, Social Venture Partners Toronto, and Women Health Sharing, and has participated in a number of boards and coalitions. And we're always happy to have Connie join us. She brings expertise from a not just an organizational sense, but also in, from her rich experience. So welcome, Connie. Glad to be here. It will be a wonderful event. So Nancy, I think we'll simply go into a little bit about uh, today's agenda and the purpose of the purpose of the people's school. So our agenda today, we will do certainly in a moment of our welcome land acknowledgement, some introductions, and we'll share a little bit about what the purpose of people's schools are and talk about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and Agenda 30. Some of you may have been in some of our other sessions, but we're gonna take a few minutes and just talk a little bit more about that and how we're making these connections between the STGs and affordable housing. We'll have a small group discussion followed by a, a bit more conversation about how the affordable housing um, connects with the determinants of health and connects with health outcomes. We'll have another group, group discussion and share a little bit with you about what's upcoming in terms of the SDG work and housing initiatives. And I think that should take us to a, a full two hours. So the purpose of a people school, I'm, I'm not sure if any of you have, have participated before, but it's a, it's a bit of a traditional um, Anakadish movement approach to bringing people together to share first their knowledge and experience. So we go first to the people in the room to share what they've been seeing and hearing and learning. And then we start to bring in some awareness by bringing in some new, and that's where Connie might offer some insights and just some ideas and share some of her experience. We'll convene a space for innovation and collaboration. So a chance to talk about 
what might be happening in your work or sharing what's happening in your communities, have some time to build some networks and linkages between folks, and really look at what might inspire some action. When we leave a people's school, we don't leave a people's school with a, a big long action plan, but we inspire action for you to go back to your communities and then to be able to do that work together. So this process, we use participatory methods, we use individual reflection, small group meetings, plenary discussions when you know we don't have a too big a room and today we should be able to do that fine. Stakeholder discussions, including first voice, cross-sector representation. We try to share responsibility for the experience and the outcomes, and we document the process and share the results. And again, really happy to have Catherine Irving with us today. She does a great job of creating summaries and briefs for us following our, our great discussions. Sometimes there's a lot to get through, and um, she manages to really create those documents well. And they'll all be posted on the website after the meeting. We'll give her a few days, but you can go back and look through uh, some of the documentation that's there from our previous people's school and and it's quite thorough. All right, that's, Pauline, that's are we yeah, ready to go? We're good to go. Thanks, Nancy, for that great setup for the day. And I think Nancy invited people to introduce themselves in chat. And I see some of you have, but we'd love to hear who all of you are in the room with us today. We've got some new faces and some faces that we've seen before, and we'd certainly love uh, to have an opportunity to see where you're coming from today and perhaps a little bit about the work that you do and your interest in this topic. And today we're talking about affordable housing in Nova Scotia, but we want to concentrate specifically on the lens of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So the first thing we're gonna do is start with a little poll. We'll get everybody engaged right from, right from the outset. So Brian, if I could ask you to launch the poll. Basically, we are just wondering, are you familiar with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and Agenda 2030? And we'll give you folks a, a couple of seconds to vote and we'll see where we are. And there's no wrong answer here. Uh, it's absolutely fine if you've never even heard of them. Uh, today is about raising awareness and uh, thinking about this lens, sharing a little bit of information about what they mean, and, uh, and then we'll connect it a little bit later to affordable housing and health outcomes. And we have got 100% of the people have voted in the room. That's fantastic. And it looks as if 71% of you are familiar with the UN SDGs, so that's great. And we've got 29% of people who are perhaps just learning about the SDGs for the first time. So that's wonderful. Thank you for engaging in that uh, quick activity. Did everybody get to see it? Okay. I think we're good to go. Now, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, as, as most of you know, are, were adopted by the United Nations and all of its member organizations in 2015. And this was a real call to action to think about the way that we do development differently. It was a departure from a pretty straightforward, and I'm being, I'm being overly simplistic here, but you know, a pretty straight departure from more focus on economic development with a much expanded view of how we look at development, looking at protection of people, of the planet, of peace and prosperity as we go down the road and do this work together. And rather than um, um, having a, too much talking about this, we have a really nice short video that captures the essence of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals really well. Understanding the dimensions of sustainable development. By endorsing Agenda 2030 and its 17 goals, the world community has reaffirmed its commitment to sustainable development to ensure sustained and inclusive economic growth, social inclusion and environmental protection, and to do so in partnership and peace. Agenda 2030 is universal, transformative and rights-based. It's an ambitious plan of action for countries, the UN system and all other development actors. The agenda inspires us to think creatively about the sustainability challenges of today so we can develop the right partnerships and take the right actions. 
At the heart of the agenda are five critical components. People, prosperity, peace, partnership, planet. These, in turn, underpin the 17 Sustainable Development Goals and are applicable in all countries. Agenda 2030 and the SDGs are not simply items on a checklist. They represent a holistic approach to understanding and tackling problems by guiding us to ask the right questions at the right time. To achieve this, we need to consider several challenges in order to work out how they connect with and impact upon each other. Finding these interdependencies helps us to address the root causes of problems and to create long-term solutions. So how does this work? Sustainable development is usually viewed through a lens of three core elements – economic growth, social inclusion and environmental protection. But it's important to remember that these are not just categories or boxes, they are connected and have aspects in common. For example, a health challenge like tuberculosis is not only determined by an unhealthy lifestyle, it could also be influenced by other factors such as poverty or air quality. To develop this approach a step further, two critical dimensions that will drive Agenda 2030 were adopted by Member States – partnership and peace. Partnerships strengthen the capacities of all stakeholders to work together. Peace, justice and strong institutions are essential for improvements in the three core areas. Genuine sustainability sits at the centre and it will be important to consider each of the SDGs through the lens of these five dimensions. Of course, we can't consider every possible angle of a single challenge. That's why it's crucial to build partnerships to share knowledge and expertise to learn how we can jointly address challenges. This requires new ways of working together focused on co-creation. National ownership is fundamental to address challenges properly. Many organizations and actors have an important role to play. Their involvement ensures long-term engagement and guarantees that no one is left behind. The universal nature of Agenda 2030 also asks us to look at the planet as one. Every country, every community has issues to address and everyone shares the responsibility and ownership to address the challenges that face us collectively. To move forward, we must develop the right capacities for Agenda 2030. We need to invest in lifelong learning to be able to advocate for change, foster action for implementation, measure progress, and to identify and empower new partners to support Agenda 2030. We all need to lead the way towards the vision of a better world within our lifetime. Because only if we ask the right questions and seek the right answers, and only if we take our responsibility seriously will we be able to achieve a truly transformational agenda, leaving no one behind. Okay, so what did you think of that video? Is there anyone who would like to share their reaction to it? We can hear from a from a few people. Mark, please. I think what's of interest to me, because I've worked within these guidelines and initiatives in Ontario, <laughs> recognize that some of the definitions from a global perspective can be regionalized, recognizing that there's needs within the region that are, are differing. And so we're allowing for, even within the language, uh, the language itself to broaden the language, for example, to move from affordable housing to cost-effective home ownership as a path to address some of these other components as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, wonderful observation. Thank you, Mark. And what's uh, what, what we're finding in our work around the, the UN SDGs, it, it's a global framework, but it's often helpful if we can think about how it connects with the work that we're doing locally. And uh, we've certainly heard from some people that it's, uh, it can be inspiring even to, to know that we're part of something larger. It's, it's we, we often get our heads down and get really busy in the work that we're doing locally, but it might be it might be helpful to think about a larger framework that we're part of. Yeah, so great, thank you. And the language we use certainly can impact how we how we think about and how we feel about the work that we're doing here on the ground as well. So let's get right into the knowledge of the people in the room, which is what a people's school is all about. So we've got a couple of discussion questions for you. And I think my colleague Kelly is going to post those questions in chat. And they are really to, uh, dig a little deeper into what are you seeing in your work in the community housing sector 
that demonstrates the impact of housing on health outcomes. So when we, we, we heard about the UN SDGs, we heard about Agenda 2030, that's talking about people, planet, prosperity, and development, but it also talks about leaving no one behind, making sure that everyone in our society, in our world, has an opportunity uh, to be well, to live well, and to, to thrive and prosper uh, in our world. And that, of course, is directly connected to health. So, and health in the broader perspective, healthy people, healthy ecosystems, healthy communities. So when we're thinking about the work in the community housing sector, how does that demonstrate the impact of housing on health outcomes? We're gonna ask for just a couple of pop-outs now from each group, just a, a round of sharing, maybe one or two points that really stood out for you. And the rest I'm hoping will be in your Microsoft note. So if I could have someone from group one, um, just share a little bit of what you heard, what you talked about, what sort of popped up for you. I think that might have been um, our team. So I was with yep. um, some, some health promoters and uh, housing provider, provider directors. Um, a lot of the work that we are we discussed um, was was around the, the advocacy. The, the action and the and the pressure to to drive um, what we know as the reality on the ground forward. Um, a lot of work has been happening in in regions um, from an integrated working perspective, uh, representing the collective voices of of all of the service providers in that area. But nonprofit organizations need capacity to become those those housing providers, those those agents of of change. Um, there's some really great work happening um, in the valley from from models that have worked for a particular um, age demographic, and now it's being expanded to 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 provide um, support for for people of all ages. Um, yeah, just we we see in our community um, work over the decades on on systemic issues such as poverty, and just the the reality that. Um, people experiencing homelessness have um, a very clear understanding of the health outcomes related to not having housing. So we'll just leave it there. Thanks. Great, thank you. So group two, what two, uh, Celeste, Erica, Lynn, Nancy, and Alex, I think. Do you have somebody who would like to report? We did talk about the complexity here or the all the different strands that were coming in which of course was picked up in the video, um, um, mental, well, mental health, because that's what I work in, but are the difficulties of finding places, difficulties of making enough money. Um, I think it was Lynn that was talking about a really wonderful place, uh, people working in Bridgewater doing some really good work about finding housing. Um, uh, mentioned about people in poverty really don't have options of moving. Um, I mentioned climate, we're talking about flooding, I know sub Anaganish area in particular. Um, and um, and, uh, and um, who was talking about, Alex was talking about in, in the Wolfville area, about the, the metal of uh, the hospitals are, have a, we're already restressed before COVID. So after, during COVID after it's even more so, so with mental health issues, if, which often happen if you don't have housing, people would go to ER uh, to emergency and the capacity is not there anymore, which of course mm -hmm. means that people coming with other issues aren't. So the idea of, um, I think the big one, and I'll let other people say if they have anything, it's the interconnected. And we did talk about the minimum wage, even if people are working full time, they're still not making enough to rent a place. So there's a, a, a lot of different aspects there. That's great, thank you, Nancy. Anyone else from that group want to add anything, Celeste? Yeah, I just think, um, again, we kind of said we can't talk about housing and health unless we look at, you know, how it, how all the other social determinants of health factor into it, whether it's where a person lives, transportation, um, and specifically um, how, 
how race factors into it, marginalized and vulnerable populations, and and also not only affordable housing, but safe, appropriate and accessible housing is also a key consideration. Often the affordable stuff is not safe, adequate or accessible. Mm -hmm. And then just the connection between a basic living wage and, and people who have housing affordability challenges is because they live in poverty often. Great, thank you, Celeste. Anyone else from that group? If not, we'll we'll move on. Um, let's say the group that had Christine, Bill, and Connie and Akin. Anyone want to offer some thoughts from your group? <coughs> sure, I can I can start. I was doing some notes. Um, similarly, uh, we talked a lot about sort of that the interconnection of housing and and other determinants of health, and gave you know those couple great examples of both how affordable housing was designed in uh, Antigonish, but also uh, in New Glasgow recently with the renovation of an existing motel and how important it was that, you know, those spaces are good quality, that they're as in not costing more than 30% of a person's income, um, that they're very close to other services and supports and opportunities for health, like recreation and the schools and the hospitals and bus routes and all of that great stuff, um, which, you know, can be a challenge for more rural areas. Uh, and so, um, you know, we really talked a lot about that kind of stuff and that by providing um, stability, I think stability came out as a really big theme that I haven't kind of heard yet in that, you know, when people have this stability and they know that they have their housing, they're not gonna get kicked out, um, their rents are gonna remain affordable, it allows them, it just opens up opportunity to do other things like, you know, go back to school or, you know, have your kids participate in recreation activities or have more leisure time to do things like gardening and learning new skills. Um, so that interconnectedness was, was really strong, I would say. And then the other piece that of course we talked about was, you know, how much um, the COVID-19 pandemic really demonstrated a very clear, you know, and bi-directional impact that, um, you know, people who were living in overcrowded housing and or sure in shelters or on the street were, were very likely to be impacted by COVID-19 and by the spread of it, have more severe disease outcomes, but that the pandemic itself was also creating um, housing precarity and homelessness and that people who maybe were couch surfing or something like that were getting kicked out because people were trying to avoid overcrowding or if you became COVID positive, you were not protected at all from, from being uh, displaced from your, your housing. Oh, lots there. Thank you very much, Christine. Anyone else from the, the group Christine was in want to add anything? Okay. Um, don't forget the link for the forum if you get a chance to make sure your notes from your group discussion are popped in there. And then if you have any other thoughts as we're going on and you want to go back and add to that, you can always go back and add a few things. I think we have one group left. Um, Kellyanne, Lucinda, Mark, Sean, Simone, and Tina. Would someone like to report some of your discussion highlights? Perhaps I can start and then the others can participate or contribute as well. I think we had really diverse representation within the group. Uh, so some, we spoke about uh, some of the changes we see going on within our municipalities locally, where the local community is responding more quickly than the municipalities can, can you know, shift policy to. But there's changes at a municipal level in terms of allowing for different housing types, density, and um, Another thing which I didn't mention before is that also that a, a survey is being done by the Bridgewater municipality just to understand what is the need because I think it's really important to get a handle on the definition of what the requirement is. There was some good conversation at a, at a different at sort of federal government level in terms of what's being done in terms of policy and program. We did spend a lot of time though was actually looking at directly the connection between housing and health and some personal real life experiences which for me, reinforced how deeply entrenched this challenge is, um, how deeply they are tied together, and also reminded that one of the challenges of living in rural communities 
is how that becomes even more complex when you don't have access to transportation, the challenges of isolation, which have been exacerbated by COVID as well. So that was for me um, really galvanized to come to some understanding of what are some of the solutions that we can provide as well. Great, thank you very mar much, Mark. I think what's coming out is you know a lot around the complexity of issues that create that stability that Christine noted. Great, well, a lot of good conversations and I at first thought 20 minutes was too long, but I don't think it is. I think that you know, we could probably talk all day and never get off the, this discussion of what we're seeing in communities and what people are experiencing. And I think, you know, though, again, those two things keep coming back to me, that complexity and the need for stability around all of those intersecting determinants of health. We're going to open the mic now to Connie and to ask Connie if she would provide some feedback, some insights from what she's heard and also just share a little bit about what some of her experience has been. So Connie, I'm going to open the floor to you. Thanks. Um, so I'm going to play with two things uh, for you, but first, um, so I have spent most of my uh, working life in health promotion in both women's health, in public health, and in health policy, and a lot of that, most of that has been focused on disparities, inequities, um, determinants of, of health, and it's only recently that I've come Although I've written about housing as a determinant of health and worked with um, housing activists and housing related researchers, it's only recently that um, about a year and a half that I've been volunteering with Antigonish Affordable Housing. And so really deepening my understanding. I never thought I'd be in a landlord position um, or a housing development position and so lots of learning there. Um, two things that I want to bring in is just naming and it really came from um, it came up uh, so actually I think every group fed back to this. Um, what kind of some of the research says about the all the different facets of health that play into um, or housing that play into health. So affordability, access to housing, which is a little different than availability of housing. The housing might be there, but you might not be acceptable as a tenant or a buyer versus that it actually exists in the multiplicity of forms that we need from, you know, temporary shelters and supportive housing all the way up to um, market housing. The quality of the housing in terms of how habitable it is. So is there mold in the walls or is it new and high or not new, but maintained in high quality so that it's healthy? That question that's often called neighborhood, um, and we talked about it in terms of rural versus urban or suburban, but what kind of community do you have both within the housing or within the neighborhood context of your housing, but also the setting? Are you proximate to services? Are you proximate to schools? And what access to nature do you have? Because we know about that. Um, the stability of the housing that you have, how stable is it or how precarious is it? Are you likely to be shifted out? Are you likely to be disrupted? Um, and then that whole, um, I think, newer coming to that picture of environment, both um, some of the factors I've already talked about that environmentally impact on tenants, but also how does the housing itself impact on the planet, the community, the world? Um, and then to think about those factors, not just as individual factors, we're not just talking about the moment of time on health when you're in this housing or that housing, but those are life course impacts and intergenerational impacts, um, both through kind of physical and mental health, but also through things like the failure to acquire wealth because you're not able to get a mortgage, you're not able to own the house, you're not able to pass it on. And we think about the way in which laws, particularly well-researched in the US, but also in Canada, blocked um, Black Canadians and uh, Indigenous Canadians from being able to get bank loans or being able to get mortgages. So um, that's there. And I, I would just turn it back and open it up. But the other thing I could talk about if people wanted is just teasing out that um, complexity of how determinants of health are not just that moment in time, but a whole pathway of uh, vulnerability that then impacts outcomes and then impacts consequences. but I also want to listen. Thank you, Connie. That's really helpful to, to see, um, to hear how those themes came together for you yeah. and to, to 
unpack that complexity a little bit, but also to mm -hmm. look at it in its totality. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for offering mm -hmm. that. That's fantastic. So I'm wondering, are there questions from the floor uh, for Connie? Are there things that, that, uh, that Connie touched on that you'd like to tease out a little bit more? Please feel free to pop any comments in chat as well. Comments or questions, Christine? <laughs> No, I just wanted to comment so that I really appreciated the, the note, you know, bringing us back to that life course approach and the interconnection of not being able to access wealth. And um, that's something that, you know, every time I'm in these conversations around affordable housing, it's always about rental, which, again, you can provide some stability, but, you know, one of the only ways that Canadians can access you know, one of the biggest assets we have at our disposal is is housing. And I can speak to my own personal experience of having um, moved into a CMHC funded mortgage house. So went from a over 100 year old house without an indoor toilet um, to a brand new build that my parents were able to uh, to mortgage and did one day end up owning. And so the difference that that made both in terms of, you know, the trajectory and the pathway, um, the physical health, but more the social, because it also wasn't one of those five in a row identical and everybody knew who you were. Um, that piece was really big. And the fact that they could eventually one day, they own that house, right? And they were able to take that wealth and, and use it to support their health towards um, later stages of their life. So that was pretty meaningful. And I, I think, yeah, this conversation about access to wealth and um, owning and renting and all of that. Like, I think it's an important one not to overlook. We tend to just think, well, we got to get a roof over people's heads. And so uh, we don't always think about those broader implications. Yes, thank you. And I think that, that for me is that continuum, right? Because it's important to have the shelter, the roof over the head, but it's really important to have the, you know, more than bricks and mortar, you know, the social <laughs> across the continuum, but it's also important to be shifting. So the work that's happening around community residential land trusts um, is very exciting. Um, the idea of rent to buy models that are ex being explored is very exciting. So, um, and I, um, at one of the models that I became aware of probably 20 years ago was fascinating to me. And it was uh, Yale University of all things that owns lots of land in downtown New Haven, Connecticut realized that they wouldn't need a lot of that land for a very long time. And that a lot of the land near the university um, was occupied, old decaying housing, occupied particularly by Black Americans. And so they set up essentially what I would call a homestead program um, that uh, families were able, if they made certain in-kind or financial investments of improving the house that they rented over a three-year period, then they shifted into a, a rent to buy and an ownership. Um, and with a hundred, I think a hundred year lease. Um, so, um, you know, we just, we need to get more creative. I'm also interested in exploring um, rent to buy for women fleeing domestic violence so that we can end the generational cycle of uh, what we would call legislated poverty and have those health mm -hmm. outcomes and really change the trajectory um, for the whole family. Yeah, great stuff. Thank you, Julianne, thank you. There was recently oh, in one of our other webinars, we had a speaker show us a, uh, an example of a rent to own association that um, really created supportive ways for that transfer of ownership where the um, organization purchased homes and then created rent to own agreements where there was training and education involved in helping people become homeowners, home repairs and savings and managing debt and all the things that take people along that pathway to being able to sustain home ownership. It was a really great model and I got kind of inspired about it as well because I think there really does need to be something that fills that gap. But we do see a lot of other hands, so I won't speak anymore. Good. Pauline, who did you see come up next? I think we've got Mark, Nancy, and Celeste. And then I think we'll, we'll give Connie an opportunity, obviously, to respond. And then let's get folks back into some more conversation, and we'll see where that takes us. It's so, such a wonderful opportunity to have this group of people in the room together 
So Mark, please. A question I have for Connie and maybe for the group is to see where there's been a change in the understanding of what a home means. So the home could be originally a, a, um, a single family dwelling with a, a garage in the front that was roughly, you know, three bedrooms and a, and a, and a and house and, and that being built. And I still see that it was being built, but I don't I think it's the difference between want and need in terms of housing design. And then the second thing is where, when I used to live in Toronto, a statistic was they were, over 100,000 people living in apartments, uh, in living in condominiums right at the at, at Eglinton and Young intersection, where 80% of those people were single and had all that space. So it's really then the understanding of how do we repurpose existing building stock that is supportive. So you have allow seniors to stay in their homes longer, but also allow for a greater uh, occupancy of for rental accommodation. Um. So I'm not an expert on answer to that, but very briefly, I do think um, one of the positive outcomes of the cost of housing going up has been a shift to a more European concept that not everyone will own a home. So if you have some income, you might be able to find stable rental or a different, this kind of rent to buy or a different piece. Um, I lived for 30 years on Toronto Island, which is a very unusual community where the housing is entirely out of the market. So, uh, it, and I was a squatter for years, um, but once legislation came in, that housing is totally outside of the market and land trusts are gonna help create that um, residential. It really, the island is a residential land trust, but there's a whole movement in that way. And I think that will reshift the purposing. And the other reason I mentioned the island is there's been a lot of effort on Toronto Island to help older islanders figure out how to divide their house into a two units or a granny flat. And the community is supporting that effort. How do you become a landlord? What do you need to know about the landlord lease? How can you do that redesign? Um, volunteer folks helping with that design. Um, and so that you can keep people uh, both an older person housed and get a younger person in. There's a wonderful model that I also know from Toronto of a, um, a retirement uh, concept, not a nursing home, but a retirement, long-term care, actually it was long-term care, where they, for some bizarre reason, had a shortage of uh, people in need of long-term care. That doesn't exist anymore. But they brought in university students at cost. And the intergenerational piece that happened was remarkable in terms of shifting the quality of community for both ages. Great so, stuff. And some of our colleagues are noting some resources in chat for us as well. So keep an eye on that as we move through the people's school. So Nancy, and then we'll go to Celeste. Yeah, I, and I apologize, I'm gonna have to leave early, but I did want to mention, Connie mentioned the word nature. And mm -hmm. um, I'm a client psych psychotherapist and there is so much roaming re research coming out now, which we, we obviously know, but with the research is coming out saying we need two hours in nature per week to be happy or something like that. And, um, and BC doctors now can issue prescriptions for people to get out to parks at all. But in all this housing for people's health, physical, mental, and also I think we really need to focus on relationship to the land and to the, uh, not only to keep people healthy, but also in terms of floods. Um, we're looking at Eisner Cove wetlands, uh, keeping that as a wetland, everybody's been following that I imagine. Um, and what this means in terms of housing, how we protect the environment, don't give up any more environmental space because we need it. So I'd like to bring that out. Connie mentioned that in passing, but I just want to focus on this that, um, and I'm really glad Mark said about that you were hearing new models um, because this single family home, it's, things aren't, can't stay the way they are. So, um, and also community gardens, all this sort of thing should be part of housing. People are happier with them. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Nancy. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. And the recording will be available online in a, in, in a week or so. So you'll be able to uh, hear what happened after you left. Thank you. Great. All right, take care. Celeste. Um, I just wanted to kind of uh, dovetail a little bit on Mark's comment around aging in place. I mean, Nova Scotia has an increasingly um, 
old population, our demographic is becoming older and older. We know that that's the trend setting across the country. And in a lot of rural communities, there are a lot of older adults that are trying to maintain their homes on very fixed incomes, living in homes that far exceed what their needs are, and are very interested in moving into a different type of housing situation. Unfortunately, there are so few available that we have to start rethinking about what the housing needs are for our aging population and provide all kinds of alternatives. Most of the alternatives that are available are still not affordable. So, you know, like it, there would be housing stock available in rural communities that would open up for younger people to move into if there was suitable housing options available for older population to move into. Absolutely. And that, and that does make me think about co-housing options. How do you do a little bit of that? Um, you know, not just it, it absolutely Celeste, the, the stuff that older people can move into, but also how to transform their housing so they might stay and house younger people. Yeah, I put a link in uh, for the Canada Home Share program that does that with students. Thanks for that, Celeste. So Nancy, I think we'll give people an opportunity to get back together in small groups again. I we have so. the groups are ready to go, Pauline. Yeah, wonderful. So we've got a couple more questions for you. Again, we'll remind you of that Microsoft form that you can uh, enter your notes into in your small group. But our questions now are, how are these intersecting issues or factors of health outcomes and affordable housing? How are they being addressed in your community? And if I can bring you back to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals video for just a moment, what could happen in your community to ensure that no one is left behind? Welcome back, everyone. And we're going to ask your groups to share just one really aha moment for you, something that really stood out from your discussion. And then if you've got some other things you want to add, you can post them in chat or just pop them into your form. But we'll start with just sort of one or two really important uh, insights that you had in your group discussion. So group one was Lynn, Nancy and Peggy. If someone would like to share, please feel free to go ahead. Hi folks, it's Nancy. I'm going to share uh, for our group. And I just have to say there's a whole bunch of Nancy's on here. That's never happened. <laughs> I never have three Nancy's, never. <laughs> And I know a fourth one in housing, so I think there's four of us now. It's great. It must be must be something about the work, yeah. Uh, so in our group, I guess what I would share, um, and it sort of came out of a conversation that Lynn started us with. Lynn is involved with a, a wonderful project in Truro area with land trust, so traditional uh, Black community in Truro that has been pushed out through gentrification and an amazing new project that they're starting. They're just working on their terms of reference. But I think the key for me was in terms of what could happen in our communities to ensure no one is left behind. We talked a lot about it, it can't happen in isolation. We need to work together. We need to work in partnerships with coalitions, identify groups that have the funding, identify the connects to some of the housing, the land trusts. No one group we feel can do it um, by ourselves. So we were having quite a chat about uh, different stakeholders, whose role is what. Um, one of the suggestions was even a list from this webinar to be able to come forward in terms of uh, folks being able to connect after this webinar. But that was sort of uh, our nutshell. Anything you want to add, Peggy or, or Lynn? Oh, that's great. No, that's great. Thanks, Nancy. That's great. Thank you very much. And, you know, the whole idea of, of collaboration and working with others, and it's certainly an interdisciplinary approach to be able to address all of these things. So I think that's, that's a great point that you mentioned. I'm going to go on now to room two, which is Alex, Kellyanne, Lucinda, Sean, and Tina, if someone would like to report on your significant thoughts. I will, uh, I'll try to speak up for the group. Can you guys hear me? Yes. It's uh, it's Alex LeBlanc. Um, I uh, we were speaking about um, the issues of housing, and uh, Sean shared a, a really positive story about Medicine Hat Alberta, and that they got their housing issues down to a net zero. Um, 
And uh, I'm sorry, I have memory issues. So that is one of my disability related things. Um, and uh, another member from our group shared about the Northwood facility and how they're really championing for accessibility in the Northwood facility. So um, that was really pleasant to see. So yeah, that, that's a summary from our group. Great, thank you very much, Alex. Room three, Celeste, Christine, Connie, and Mark. Aha moments for you. We didn't talk about who would report back, but I'll share one thing. And it was really about, um, because of the complexity, there's, it's astoundingly hard to make difficult choices. Difficult choices are needed, and they're very hard to make. Um, and, and we talked a fair bit about policy and how do you create room for responsive creativity within policy? How do you shift so municipal governments can borrow and lend, and maybe the feds back that up? How do you shift um, so that policy is built more with um, recognition of lived experience, engagement of people with lived experience and uh, dignity at the heart of it. Um, so, um, but we also acknowledge that political will wasn't strong. So it, we weren't uh, particularly upbeat. Yeah, and I think one of the other things that we kind of acknowledged is the need to reallocate resources and put more money into kind of that prevention and uh, early early development so that it's not all going into the acute system. It's cheaper to house people than to deal with their health issues afterwards. And if I can add, I think a thought was the current for-profit development model does not work when it comes to developing, I said this before, financially accessible housing. So the risk of developers is time if you can help reduce that risk so they can take less profit, but increase the likelihood that the project can get done by providing uh, loan guarantees, uh, front of the line in terms of permitting and approval, um, greater opportunity to optimize the use of the, of the land for the type of housing need that's there, that it's more likely a developer is going to build the kind of housing we need. Great, thank you very much. Anyone now from room four, which is Akin, Angela, Bill, and Erica. Some few contributions based on what we discussed. We discussed about um, your rent should not exceed 30% of the income, uh, which currently may not be what is uh, applicable in some locations within the province. And what happens if someone gets a better job or situation changes? Uh, I think that is very key. Who is, who is monitoring? Who is going to track that? Is the person still going to be allowed to stay within the building if situation changes for good? So uh, I, I think this is very key because um, it is an affordable housing property. And what happens when situation changes? Who is going to monitor? Who is monitoring? Yeah, I think those are the two things that I think, to me, uh, really caught my attention there. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Akin. Erica, do you want to add anything? Um, I was just going to say a lot of our comments echoed what Nancy shared at the beginning, Nancy Stewart, to be specific, um, that uh, it was a lot about collaboration that's needed to find good solutions and that ultimately um, there needs to be more, more support and more dedicated emphasis on affordable housing through the community-based sector and not um, just private developers because their end goal is, is typically profit. So even if there is an agreement for affordable housing at the beginning, um, that might only last for so long. And so if we can shift the focus and emphasis on agreements that are being made to to community and nonprofit sector, then that will um, lead to more long-term affordable housing. Great, thank you, Erica. Angela, please go ahead. I just want to uh, reinforce what Erica is saying, because um, I think that in the short term, the private sector can uh, help with the supply, uh, but they can never address the affordable affordability issue 
and uh, the issue of affordability that we face is not going away and there should be far more support uh, for the non-profit housing provider. I see a lot of support around capacity development of, of a lot of groups, but quite frankly, where is the equity so people can, uh, can get in the game and uh, start building their own equity so they can uh, build their, their portfolios? We are very, very small. Uh, as a, as a sector compared to, to other provinces. And every penny, I think, that goes to the private sector diverts us from the long-term solution. Thank you, Angela. And just before we ask Connie to give us some sort of feedback on those insights, was there anyone else that had another sort of aha moment they wanted to add before we move on? There's lots of things coming up for folks. So Connie, I'm going to let you ask you to open your mic and just share a little bit on what you heard and help us just sort of wrap up this discussion a little bit. Yeah. So I think, um, um, you know, the range, the breadth and range of what people talked about was encouraging um, uh, in terms of both examples of good work. Um, but I think what's critical is um, you know, not just to uh, pull up each example, but to distill what is the, what are the factors that are allowing success? Um, and um, how are they um, scalable or how are they transferable? Um, how do we um, share them uh, across? And so I'm very excited that the, um, the creation of the nonprofit um, housing uh, network in Nova Scotia is just ahead of us because I think that will um, um, create a very different opportunity for co-learning, for co-experimentation, for collaboration and partnership that we're talking about and, and for advocacy and pressure to um, get that investment um, that people are saying is needed. So um, yeah, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Connie. Pauline, do you wanna uh, do a little bit of sharing with us on what's coming up? We're gonna have a poll to just see where folks are on the United Nations Sustainable Goals and then uh, wrap up a bit. So go ahead, Pauline. Yeah, thank you, Nancy. Thank, thank you, uh, Connie. So Kelly has very kindly just posted this poll for us. And we're just wondering how things may have changed since the beginning of our people's school today and wondering how familiar are you with the UN SDGs and Agenda 2030 now? So we've got the options of very familiar, somewhat familiar, and not at all familiar. So this will just help us give, our, give us a little sense of whether we had some learning taking place here today um, as it relates to the goals. And uh, Connie and I are both on the board of the Antigonish Affordable Housing Society, and I often say to people that we don't we don't necessarily sit around the boardroom table talking about the SDGs, but we definitely talk about how can we create the best possible homes for people to live well in, in our community, so that it strengthens the health of our community um, overall for both individuals and collectively. So good stuff. So we see that 92% of those present are feeling somewhat familiar with the sustainable development goals at this point, and 8% are feeling very familiar. So that's hopeful. Uh, and and we, you know, our hope is that at least talking about affordable housing, accessible housing, appropriate housing as part of a broader framework, um, maybe it inspires us a little bit and lets us know that we're not doing this work in a vacuum. You know, we're working really hard locally, but there is a, a larger global movement happening to hopefully ensure that no one is left behind, or at least to give us that goal to work toward. So good stuff. We'll leave the poll there for now. And I just want to take just a couple more minutes to let you know what's coming up in terms of our work together. And as has been alluded to, uh, we've got a meeting coming up toward the end of October. But before that, um, next Wednesday, October 19th, we have our fourth in a series of people's schools happening. And that people's school will be very similar today in the sense that it starts with the knowledge of the people in the room. 
and we will have someone here acting as Connie has for us today as a resource person. But the topic next Wednesday will be looking at the role of municipalities and affordable housing in Nova Scotia. And we're really pleased to have Erica Shea, who is the executive director of New Dawn Enterprises in Cape Breton. Uh, they are a very uh, significant player in the affordable housing world in the province. And Erica is going to, uh, as I said, act as Connie has for us today, be our resource person in looking at the role of municipalities and affordable housing. And Kelly, may I ask you to post the uh, link to the registration for this People's School in chat? And you're all invited to join us. We would welcome you into the space. And I know it's gonna be a great conversation just as today's conversation has been very uh, fruitful as well. Colleen. Yes, just Connie. Say, just before you close up, cause I think it, as we get to the very end, it gets harder. Um, and we have a little bit of time. I'd love to take like two minutes and just loop us back to that health question and then let yeah. you close with those events. And I think because the piece was named Health Outcomes, it made me think about this. When I used to work in public health and I worked in policy and public health across a whole range of big issues, including housing, I thought I really understood determinants of health. But it wasn't until I worked here at the Knowledge Center and worked with community people, public health all across the country that and the findings of the WHO, the World Health Organization's Commission on the Social Determinants of Health really not only came out, but started to get interpreted and applied and therefore deepened that um, my thinking went further. And so I wanna share with some of you this sense of how the modeling evolved as the commission came to maturity. And that is if we think about, and it's just the pathways and the layering of how all the complexity plays in. And so um, there's a nice model that kind of looks at, you're looking at the socioeconomic context or position of a person or a population, mm -hmm. class, gender, race, occupation, education. All of those then affect exposure and that's where housing comes in. So we're exposed to better or unhealthy housing, unsafe work. Um, inadequate food, um, social exclusion, low recreation, not, no nature access, all of those kind of exposures that enhance quality of life, wellness and health or diminish it. And that in turn then amplifies vulnerability because risk is clustered for some population groups and it is diminished or really almost um, taken away for other population groups. And then that vulnerability starts to impact outcomes that you see through health, medical care, really, and health ser services, social services. And so programs and interventions are not adjusted. They're not appropriate. They're not culturally sensitive. They're not physically or mentally accessible. They're inadequate. All of those type of factors. And then that leads to the layer of consequences. And so the consequences of being ill or facing a social challenge have deeper negative impact for some groups, for all the individuals and the populations who experience multiple and intersecting disadvantages. Um, so people who don't get sick days or vacation, they don't get paid benefits, they have less flexibility at work, they might have recently relocated and be more greatly isolated. All of that housing constraint fits at every one of those places. So when we think about policy, we need to think about um, how you break down structural positioning, how you shift exposure, how you um, constrain against or protect against vulnerability, how you modify those services or care, how you therefore see less um, variable consequence by population. So um, anyway, that, that helps me a little bit think it through and I thought it might be, um, and I'm on my phone sadly, um, but um, you could find that kind of model um, at the National Collaborating Center for Determinants of Health website. Great. Connie, that is so helpful. Thank you for thank you for, for giving us that synopsis really in, in, in the end there to help us tie the pieces together. I, I find it's 
policy is something that exists out there, but unless we think about it really intentionally at every level, we're not necessarily addressing it in a way or, or trying to influence and impact it in, in a way that we could. So great reminder, a very helpful reminder. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Okay, so, and again, next week we'll come together to talk about the role of municipalities in affordable housing. I want to give Kelly a few moments at this point as well. So Kelly, I will stop sharing my screen. And Kelly is going to tell us a little bit more about a tool, a virtual, a virtual mapping tool that we're using to try to hopefully inspire building community around this work. So Kelly, please. Tell us about your work. I hope everybody can see this fantastic, colorful image that is shareable. Um, it's basically what the map of Nova Scotia nonprofit housing providers, groups, networks, coalitions, cooperatives, and, and other groups will, will look like. Um, its purpose is to connect us, uh, to unify us, to demonstrate that as a sector, we're prepared, we're knowledgeable, we're skilled, organized, and connected. So we have a survey that can support your organization, your work um, being placed on the map. And the survey supports the six sustainable development goals that we're directly addressing in this project. So no poverty, clean and affordable energy, good health and well-being. We've got sustainable cities and communities, reduced inequities, and finally partnerships for the goals. So this, this is a fantastic opportunity, I think, to demonstrate local action on the ground in Nova Scotia, as well as create a made in Nova Scotia solution for um, moving forward together and continuing to build together. Uh, thanks, everybody. Kelly, can you post the link? The survey link, you got it. Great. Great. Okay. Thanks, Kelly. And uh, as Kelly mentioned, we're hoping that that map will become a tool for connecting us. So we don't, we don't want to create something that's static and uh, will be sort of left on a website somewhere. So as our work moves forward, we'll be thinking about how can we continue to ensure that this map is a living, breathing um, a tool that we can use to support all of our work throughout the community housing sector in the province. So great work, Kelly, thank you so much. And the final thing that I will share with you today is that on October 26th and 27th, we have got people coming together from across the province who are either nonprofit housing providers or housing groups, networks, and coalitions that support the work of the nonprofit housing sector. And we're coming together after almost two years of consultation across the province as part of our Build Together project, which is all about strengthening the community housing sector, to decide whether to form a Nova Scotia nonprofit housing association. We've uh, heard a call for this uh, in all of our work, so we, we expect the answer to be affirmative. Uh, but the workshop or the, the time we spend together will really be focused on how do we create an organization that's based and underpinned by the values that have been expressed so articulately and so clearly in our work over the last year and a half? How will we look at creating an organization that is governed in a way that it is welcoming, not only welcoming, but it's living diversity, equity, inclusion, and decolonization? How do we create an organization that has a sustainability plan um, built in right from the get-go? And how are we going to take some leadership and moving this initiative forward. And the whole purpose of the Nova Scotia Nonprofit Housing Association will be to support the work of the organizations who are trying to create housing solutions for people who are most in need in our province. And uh, there's a whole model that's been developed around that that's available on our webpage. Uh, but on October 26th and 27th, uh, we will be coming together uh, virtually and in person. So there will be a physical space here at St. Francis Avery University, and we will also have a virtual space. We want to make sure that this 
engagement process is accessible to as many people as possible. Our, our next people's school on the role of municipalities is a big one. We've spent the last two years hearing about how municipalities are coming in and helping out and finding ways to be engaged. And I think that'll be a really fruitful discussion as well. So thanks everyone for the time. I think we're ending on time today, Pauline, well, which is great. And yes, I'll just yes, say a final, let you say a final thank you. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to certainly acknowledge Connie Clement for joining us today. Connie is a fantastic example of the wealth of knowledge and expertise and wisdom and generosity of spirit that we have in our communities. And it's really, really kind of you, Connie, to volunteer to spend your time with us this morning and to offer such, such wonderful insights and, uh, and provocative thoughts as well for everyone here who's present. So we really appreciate you taking the time to do that. And I'm sure if we look in all of our communities, uh, we've got more Connie's there than we think. And it's really important for us to, uh, to be, to be um, asking people, asking people to walk with us on this journey. So thank you, Connie, really appreciate your time. And thank, thank you to all of you for joining us. And hopefully we'll see you again next week or somewhere down the road. Take care, everyone. Have a great day.